big event, waiting for President von Hindenburg, all dressed up in his uniform of Field Marshal of the German Army, while the fleet in the harbor greets him with a presidential salute, a fleet conspicuous by the absence of the great battleship so prominent before the war. 60,000 people are gathered to see the show. It's a solemn occasion, and not a sound is heard. It's five minutes to 12, and the launching schedule for high noon. Anticipation fills the air as the president gets ready. Suddenly, the great ship starts to slide down the ways. The crowd's horrified. Such a thing has never happened before. The ship had not been christened, and the president tries to make the best of an embarrassing situation. But the sailors are superstitious. The Deutschland's name is in the record book, but she's an unchristened vessel just the same. She may be a good cruiser, but she'll never go to heaven. The good ship Portland brings a distinguished German visitor, but at his own request, his reception is much more sedate than the welcome he received last year. With the doctor is Frau Einstein, who takes care of them as though he were a baby. Dr. Einstein is here to work out some new theories at the California Institute of Technology, and you can expect some hot stuff. Imagine being famous among millions of people for working out a formula understood only by 12 men. Now, if the good doctor will only work out a formula to help us work out our income tax, he'll even be more famous. All England is grieving, and every British heart is with His Majesty's fleet, conducting the last services for the officers and men of the M2, over the very spot where the unhappy submarine lies buried a hundred feet below. For a week, airplanes have been helping in the search, trying to locate the M2's watery grave off Portland Light. Day and night, the Navy continued its search, looking for oil spots and wreckage that might be a clue to the missing undersea boat, hoping against hope. Sister submarines stood by to help, but it was no use. The 61 brave men were doomed. And so today, their memory is honored by their brothers of the service, men who know intimately the unfortunate victims, trapped by a hideous fate from which there was no escape. But England is proud of her loss, no prouder than the widow of Commander Leathers of the M2. Her wreath is last, and her card reads, in memory of my husband and the officers and men he had the honor to command. A beautiful epitaph. Uncle Sam's newest cruiser, the Indianapolis, and other warships in Havana Harbor marks a turning point in the affairs of the Junta, which suddenly seized power in Cuba. The revolutionary group, including the former Army Sergeant Batista, now Colonel and Chief of Staff, selects a provisional president from among its members. The new president is Dr. Ramon Graal San Martin, a physician of Havana. He is sworn into office at the Presidential Palace, where a huge crowd gathers to cheer him and hear his inaugural address. His pledge of order and a stable government, modeled on that of the United States, arouses great enthusiasm among his followers. In case he forgets his pledges, however, there are several reminders for him right at his doorstep. Cuba must be free from revolt. the world's greatest horror of horrors. The luxurious ward liner, Morrow Castles, being raked by flames, which broke out mysteriously shortly after midnight during a heavy storm eight miles off the Jersey coast. Many of the 300 passengers were trapped in their cabins. Some of the lifeboats were lowered, but others were burned in their davits. The gray dawn found the Jersey coast from Asbury Park to Point Pleasant dotted with hapless victims of a terrible disaster. Many are near death. Heroic first aid treatment on the beach has saved scores of lives this morning, but for many, it is too late. 
The Sands, where thousands played and frolicked this summer, has become a vast morgue. More than 150 bodies have been gathered in. In all, 197 persons are dead or missing. Meanwhile, the monarch of Bermuda is steaming into New York with 75 survivors of the catastrophe, picked up from the sea when the Bermuda ship steamed to the aid of the stricken liner. Many of them are at the point of death. Several died after being rescued. Anxious and frantic relatives hunt the pier as the rescue ship gives up its pitiful toll. The plight of some of the survivors is heartrending. Little Robert Leonai of Woodside, Long Island, lost his father and brother. The steamship, Andrea Lukenbach, also was rushed to the scene of the disaster by its captain, Henry Hill, and picked up a score or more of half-dead passengers or crew who had leaped from the blazing inferno into the deep. What an end to a joyous 17-day cruise of the Caribbean. Aroused from sleep only a few hours from home and in scanty night attire, hurled into a maelstrom of death. They are still too stunned to tell a coherent story of those hours of terror. As you see, I have a watch here that stopped exactly at 25 minutes to five. That's the time I jumped in the water. And from then on, I hung around the water, trying my best not to get all excited for seven hours. The boy on my life belt that didn't have no life belt or life preserve on. So they took him on and left me there. And three hours later, one of the, one of the boats picked me up. We were, in, we were in the water five hours. All except that there was another girl in our party who was in another room and we couldn't find her and I still don't know whether the, she has been rescued or not. I'm hoping very much that she was. the seas, the giant French luxury liner Normandy on her maiden voyage, a floating skyscraper, the largest and fastest ship afloat. And what a send off she gets from the crowds as she starts her initial ocean crossing. Full speed ahead and she's built for speed. Her officers are out to win the laurels of the Atlantic with this marvel of maritime engineering. And her knife-edged prow is cutting the waves at express speed, breaking all transatlantic records. There's the captain, master skipper of this super craft, and what a craft she is. Her broad top deck forms a veritable playground. The glass-enclosed lower decks are spacious club rooms for recreation and comfort, a floating hotel, an ocean paradise. Among the distinguished passengers on this historical trip is Madame Albert Lebrun, wife of the President of France. Inside, the Normandy is an elaborate palace with winter gardens and other amazing appointments. The vast dining room is the equal of any hotel banquet hall. The great liner cost 800 million francs, about 40 million dollars to you. And it's plain that not all of it went into steel and machinery. But the ship's immediate bid for fame is in its speed. And its 160,000 horsepower engines are driving her towards America at a new unheard of pace for ocean passage. 30 knots, more than 35 miles an hour, cutting hours from the trip between the continents. Bringing America and Europe closer together. And what a welcome the great vessel gets in New York waters. The harbor is alive with boats, craft of all descriptions, voicing a wild greeting to the new mistress of the waves. What a giantess she is. More than a thousand feet long, four city blocks with a gross tonnage of nearly 80,000 tons.
I am reminded of another early motive and knowledge, ordering her every move. ...will assume command, but at present the weight of worry is not his, which has grown out of their three years' dinner. It is the up-to-the-minute culmination of the centuries-old tradition of our Seagirt Island.
back from months of fighting in General Franco's nationalist army in Spain, 10,000 Italian legionnaires disembark at Naples. Happy, no doubt, to be back in their native land. Italy's proud of their record, as is their king, who reviews the homecoming battalions. The troops are only a part of those sent to fight in Spain, but it is expected that others will return soon. Twenty-eight men of war steam into New York Harbor at dawn. The Navy's tribute to the New York World's Fair. The largest group of ships to visit here in five years joined seven other vessels of the newly created Atlantic Squadron to give New Yorkers a rare thrill. Miss Liberty greets the Texas and New York, two of the three battleships here along with five light cruisers, numerous destroyers, seven submarines, and the aircraft carrier Ranger. The pride of the Navy, manned by 12,000 officers and men, all anxious to get ashore for a close-up look of New York and the fair. America launches a great new shipping venture, the liner America, the largest ship ever built in American yards. The biggest so far of 500 liners and cargo ships with which the government plans to put the American flag again at the forefront of ocean-borne commerce in the next eight years. As thousands cheer, Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt christens the towering vessel, and there she goes. Shortly after this epical event, the British liner Athenia, with 1,400 aboard, was torpedoed off Scotland. First victim of the war. 
The America, first U.S.-built luxury liner, is 723 feet long with a tonnage of 30,000 tons. The new queen of American shipping. The last vivid chapter in the amazing odyssey of the Nazi pocket battleship and sea raider Admiral Graf Spee. Driven to bay, battered and damaged in the sanctuary of Montevideo Harbor, with many of her crew dead and wounded, the once proud corsair of the southern seas faces certain doom. Ordered out of the harbor by Uruguay on threat of internment, the Nazi Captain Langsdorff must take his ship to sea to face insuperable odds. A flotilla of British warships has formed a cordon at the mouth of the Platte, waiting to put an end to the stricken enemy ship. The only other alternatives are internment or to send her to the bottom by order from Berlin and thus rob the British of the full fruits of victory. The pride of the German Navy put to the torch, scuttled, turned into a roaring furnace with oil and explosives to feed the flames of its monumental suicide at sea. Like the dusk of the gods, the ship a funeral pyre for Germania's naval hopes and aspirations. After seeing his ship sent to its doom by his own hand, small wonder that the German captain chose to follow it into oblivion. The Graf Spee, one of the most dramatic stories of 1939. the picture tells its own story. For years, we disarmed in the hope that I'll tell of security in invincible strength. From now on, until great...
Manchester's leave Buckingham Palace on the footed state. In the chair, its warmth is most evident. The Duke and Duchess of Gloucester. Then the royal coach draws up and from it out step the king, the queen and the princesses. A high spot this for the crowd. While farewells begin to be plainly seen in all of them is sincerity. There's a catch at my throat as I see the princesses curtsy to their grand. Even the train seems impatient. The royal travellers go aboard. Their daughters go with them as far as Portsmouth. The arrival at Portsmouth. More meetings and partings. This is a big moment for the city where I'm very high. The All possible points of vantage are strongly held by many more people than they can easily accommodate. And the King Admiral goes where it would stop. The air is heavy with emotional loyalty. Has sailed. Aeroplanes dip in salute, forming a popular ballad. God send you back to me. And I don't think I'm the only one who thought of it either.
German mine sinking campaign is meeting with some success, but take a look at this lot. A cheering bunch of captured enemy ships in the Scottish port and many more in magnetic mines. But the dock's fate is tragic. Somebody has named him Hitler. That's bad enough, but he cannot be brought ashore. No one wants him, so he must be destroyed. That <laughs> In England, the coronation fleet assembles, and HMS Surprise carries the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh on their review, protected by a glass cabin on a gun platform. It's a gala day for the Navy, which is in full dress to greet its commander-in-chief. Among the guests are Princess Margaret Rose and a long list of royalty. Watching the lineup of one of the greatest peacetime fleets ever assembled is Sir Winston Churchill. Spectacular in this review are yardarm trainees on one of the thousand ships representing 22 nations. You can't see them, but an estimated million people watch this fascinating display from the shore. Elizabeth ordered an extra ton of rum for all the crews. All hats off to Her Majesty, and they even come up from the deep to pay homage, and from the skies. Long live Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth. In one of the most dramatic sea collisions of recent years, the North Sea Ferry, Duke of York, is cut cleanly in half after being struck by an American oil tanker during the early hours of a misty morning. The ferry's captain and crew, assisted by the crew of the Haiti Victory, performed heroically in taking 500 passengers and crew members aboard the crippled tanker, whose bow was cleanly cut by the impact. The Haiti Victory was bound for Bremen, turned back to take part in the rescue operations. The rescued are brought ashore at Harwich, most of them miraculously none the worse for their ordeal, with pathetic reminders of the nightmare hours. The seriously injured are brought in on stretchers to be taken to waiting ambulances. Some survivors took to the lifeboats, later to be picked up by rescue ships. But with the grim nature of the collision, the final death toll was held mercifully to five, another tribute to sea bravery. In the Delaware River, just 400 yards off the New Jersey coast, flame-swept wreckage is the aftermath of a pre-dawn collision of two giant oil tankers. 82 crewmen from the Phoenix and the Penn, Massachusetts leaped into the oil-slicked water to escape the flames. 150,000 barrels of fiercely burning high-octane gasoline, a grim pyre in which one man died, many were severely burned, and which masks the fate of three more still missing. One of America's largest seagoing oil carriers the Phoenix was split in two by the impact, a $12 million disaster. And for the crewmen, a disaster measured in pain, a grim ordeal by fire and water. The William Weigel, first troop ship to sail directly from Korea to the East Coast, steams up New York Harbor. On board are 2,200 veterans of the Korean fighting, home for discharge or rotation. They spent last night anchored at quarantine, being entertained by Broadway stars, in no mood for entertainment, wishing instead to hurry home, so near and yet so far. of men against the sea is again put to the test as the Liberian steamer Greenville lies foundering in the teeth of a mid-Atlantic gale. The crew abandon ship, buffeted by the giant waves, and they swim desperately away from the heaving sides of the 6,000-ton vessel. But help is at hand. The liner Ile de France races to the scene and launches two lifeboats into the boiling sea. The two boats make four trips to the stricken vessel and rescue 24 of the 26 crew members. The other two perished as 35-foot waves crashed into the foundering ship. Aboard the liner, Captain Carrig greets the radio operator of the Greenville. The Ile-de-France arrives in New York Harbor with the rescued men, three of whom were seriously injured. 
It was one of the stormiest crossings in the great liner's history. Once again, the courage of men had cheated the sea of its prey. So the war goes on. The naval base at San Diego, California is a busy place these days. Ships are coming out of mothballs and men are being trained to man them. With an appropriation of $2 billion, the signal for all-out mobilization efforts, the Navy is taking the ramps off hundreds of fighting ships idle since World War II. Hulls and equipment and guns will soon be in A-1 fighting shape, ready once again to back up the forces of freedom. In step with the Navy's new refitting program are thousands of new recruits who will help man the Navy's expanding task forces. So it's anchors away for our ever-growing fleet. After decades of dreaming and planning, the St. Lawrence Seaway became a reality. In gala ceremonies, Queen Elizabeth and President Eisenhower officially opened the 2,400-mile link between deep water and the heart of the continent. Off the island of Guam, the Navy's research Bathyscot, Trieste, surfaces after a descent into the Marianas Trench, the deepest known hole in the Earth's oceans trip farther toward the center of the earth than Mount Everest rises above its crust. The more than seven mile plunge took the Trieste into a realm where the pressure on its hull was over nine tons per square inch. The world is strange and as hostile as any to be found on other planets. The mission recorded in these Defense Department films is as great a feat and as important a scientific breakthrough as will be the first trip of man to the moon.